My clock says 3 a.m., but I, I, you know that's the East Coast of the U.S. So as Claudia mentioned, I am a computer scientist through and through. I was a computer scientist before IPO, before people started getting rich. So I've spent nine years in a physics lab, so if you want to have uh, jokes about physicists, I can definitely talk to you about that, and I masquerade as a computational social scientist as well from time to time. Um, and the physics lab was Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, so that's where the hydrogen bomb was invented, as opposed to Los Alamos, where the atomic bomb, like whatever. So, um, I'm going to talk to you guys about two things. Uh, one is roles, so I'm going to talk about roles. I promise for those of you who have heard about roles, there's going to be some new stuff. I'm just going to quickly go through the first generation of the algorithms, and the reason I'm going to talk about roles is because computational social scientists have found it very interesting and useful for themselves. And then next, I'm going to talk about um, some work I did on tie strengths. So this idea that uh, how strong is my relationship to you? And there's going to be some new stuff there, too, if you've heard about that Oops, uh, the other way. So but I, uh, I guess I don't have to sell it to this audience, but complex networks are ubiquitous, right? So we have technological network like the power grid or the internet. We have information networks. They're called information networks because a particular node has some information in it. This is the map of science in terms of one journal citing another journal. This appendix over here at the end, uh, this white pen is humanities. Um, this uh, pinkish thing is computer science, electrical engineering. And so if you're funding uh, research in science and you want to connect, let's say, humanities to people over here, you may want to look at the different journals and see how you can accommodate that. And then um, there are also, um, Social networks, we are very familiar with social networks, like the Facebook network, and then biological networks. I do not work on biological networks, but they do exist. Now, the one thing is, because I'm a computer scientist, I'm going to use the terms graphs and networks interchangeably. I'm going to use the terms nodes and vertices inter interchangeably, and links and edges interchangeably. I know if you come from statistical mechanics, that's like, oh my god, what is she doing? But I'm a computer scientist, that's the way I think about them, right? That I have a graph, I have a network, I'm going to represent it in some data structure. I know us computer scientists get a bad rap in that we like to put things in a data structure, but if you're going to program something in this computer, you need to put it in a data structure, people, right? Otherwise, you know, and you're going to lose some information, so be it. So, um, so today I'm going to talk to you about roles. So what are roles? What we're trying to do is we're trying to um, extract functions of nodes in a network, and we're going to define roles based on um, the structural behavior of uh, the nodes in a network. So I want you to think about a network as an ecosystem, um, just like any other ecosystem like the Serengeti, uh, the species in that ecosystem have play some functional roles, and that's what we want to extract. And what I want you to think about for now, in terms of how roles are defined, is what is your connectivity pattern and to what kind of individuals you're connected to. So I want to know whether you're connected to rich 30-year-olds, right, to the, the type level, not the token level. And so what we're going to do throughout this whole exercise is how much can I get out, how much can I squeeze information for these two questions from uh, link information. So in degree, out degree, uh, total degree, weighted degree, how many males is Tina connected to, how many females is Tina call, that kind of stuff. So then, um, so what's the intuition behind this, right? So usually people think that uh, people in machine learning, data mining, uh, we just torture the data. Uh, that is not the case, right? A good machine learning data miner usually has some intuition first. So our intuition for this work was we were playing with some IP, IP communication network, and we saw that a web server, the neighborhood around the web server was very different than the neighborhood around a peer-to-peer -peer client, very different than a network around the DNS server. And so we are like, can we take advantage of the fact that these different functional types, a web server, a, a DNS client, a server, or a peer-to-peer peer, peer -peer client, have these different neighborhoods. And so uh, can we use that to extract the roles? Now, of course, um, and I uh, address, or me as a person, we don't have just one role, right? Um, some of my roles, or some of the links that you see are because of my wife, some of them are because of a computer scientist, um, and so on and so forth. So what we really want to do is have an approach that can find this mixture. A lot of you guys were interested in, for example, mobility data. My mobility data, some of it is because I live in Boston, some of it is because I'm a researcher, I have to go to Arlington, Virginia, so on and so forth, right? And so 
um, we want to be able to tease that apart. In fact, in this IP IP communication uh, network data that we were playing at, um, there were uh, IP addresses where it's not purely a web server, even though it was set up as a web server, right? That it also acts as a DNS server or as a peer-to-peer -peer client. So we really do want to find these mixtures. So what are the research questions that we want to answer? So one is, you may say, it seems to me that what you're trying to do is group nodes. And indeed, we are grouping nodes. And if you're thinking about grouping nodes, then you're going to think about community discovery, right? So community discovery, they try to group nodes as well. But they have a different objective function, and we'll get to it. And then if you're from sociology, you may say, wait a second, roles, I've heard these roles before. It, it sounds to me like positions, like equivalences. And so we're going to talk about that a little bit as well. Now, I'm a computer scientist. You give me an input, I want an output. So how do I design that black box where a network comes in and the roles come out? Right? And obviously, I want to do that automatically. The next thing was, how do I make sense of these roles? So this work started, actually, when I was at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And when I would go and talk to the subject matter experts, they would say, look, do not come back to me and say, I found three roles. Role one, role two, and role three. <laughs> right? They want to be able to make sense of it. Otherwise, the guy would have kicked me out of his office. Right? And so we need to have an approach to not say, I found role one, role two, and role three. So I'll talk about that. and then. What are some of the features that we can extract from the networks to be able to um, find these roles? And then finally, what are some of the applications that people have used that have found this useful for them? So initially, when we did this work, it was extremely difficult for us to publish it. The reason was people thought that we were saying, just chuck all of your community discovery methods. And I'm not here to say you should chuck your community discovery algorithms. I know that you all know about the problems that exist with them. The thing about it is that role discovery and community discovery are complementary uh, to each other. And I will show you examples in the real world that are doing that. Um, the thing with communities is that their objective function is to find groups of nodes that are well connected. right? So usually you're trying to maximize modularity or some conductance where the density of the links within the community, within the group of nodes, is more than crosses the boundary or more than some null model. For us, what we're trying to do is we're trying to group the nodes based on their structural behavior. So for example, if your most prominent role is this uh, red triangle, uh, this red diamond, which I haven't said what it is, then you don't need to be close to each other, right? Um, so then next um, is how similar are roles to positions from sociology, and in fact, they're very similar to each other. So, um, uh, so two nodes that have the same position in sociology are called to have an equivalence relation. And an equivalence relation, as you can imagine, is between two entities and is formally defined in sociology to satisfy these three conditions. And if you go and look into the equivalences uh, from sociology, you can come up with this taxonomy. And what we're really interested in is regular equivalences. So regular equivalences means that two people, we would say that they're regularly equivalent if they relate to equivalent others the same way. So I may be a professor at North Northeastern, and you may be a professor at Purdue, but the way we interact with our administration and the way we interact with our students are similar. right? And there are these, all these other ones, and I have tutorials on them. So for example, exact structural equivalence is whoever calls me calls you, and whoever you call, I call. Right? That's very strict, and you're not going to see that in real data. Or for example, uh, automorphic equivalence is that if you and I were to switch places in this network, the distances between the nodes do not change. And then there's these pro um, probabilistic equivalences like stochastic block models, etc. So we're interested in regular equivalences. So as I said, I'm a computer scientist, so I'm going to give you a procedure. Right? You give me an input, your input is a graph, I'm going to represent it as an adjacency matrix, node by node. right? Tina called Bob. And it can be directed, it can have attributes on the edges or, no, or on the nodes. What I'm first going to do is, this is an n-dimensional space, right? It's a square matrix. I have a million people on my rows and I have a million people on my columns. What I'm going to do is I'm going to send it to an algorithm called RefX. And what this RefX is going to do is it's going to give me a node by feature matrix. This node by feature matrix is going to have a lot less columns than n but it's going to be a dense matrix, as opposed to this n by n matrix, which was a sparse matrix. Right? We know that social networks, when you represent it as a adjacency matrix, it's a sparse matrix. So what's in this recursive um, feature extraction? So this recursive feature extraction 
is we're going to start at nodes and we're going to recursively build features just based on degree and edge weights. And we can also include edge types and, uh, and, and other kinds of information that you might have on nodes and edges. And we're going to build up um, these features where we're going to try to capture your regional information. And in particular, we're going to go back to the first two questions we asked, which is, what is your connectivity pattern? And to what type of people are you connected? So I have, I'll have i break them down into local, econet, and recursive features. So local features is basically trying to capture, are you a hub or are you a path that you have no friends, basically? right? How, how, what is your um, average in-degree weight or average out-degree weight? And then your econet, I'm sure the majority of you know what an econet is. It's a one-hop induced subgraph. So I'm the ego. I have my friends are my alters. And I have, obviously, the links between me and my alters, but the links between the alters. And so the econet-based features are trying to tell me whether the majority of my friends know each other or not, right? So whether your neighborhood is more like a star where you make sure that your friends don't, aren't friends with each other, or whether your, um, your um, egonet is a more uh, like a complete, a complete graph, and how many edges come in and out of your egonet and weights, etc. Then we have these recursive features, which are basically some aggregate of the features you have so far. So what's the maximum degree of my two hop neighbors? What's the minimum degree of my two hop neighbors? What's the minimum average incoming uh, weight uh, of my two hop neighbors, etc. So by doing this, I get a whole bunch of features. Now you may say, okay, you're doing this recursive procedure. You can do this until you die and beyond, and the album will go on. Uh, and it is true. So we have to do some kind of pruning. And so the first thing that we have to do, these features that we're creating are on different scales. And for any of you who have done any kind of data analysis, you want to make sure that your features are on the same scale. So we looked at our features and the distribution of our features, and we saw that our features tend to be, have a heavy tail. So what we are going to do is we're going to do this thing called vertical log binning, which means that I am going to bin each <coughs> of my features histogram. Think about a histogram, right? And the procedure is as follows. I'm going to sort all the values of a feature, I'm going to divide it by half. Anything in the bottom half gets, let's say, zero, a value of zero. That would be bin one. <coughs> then I'm going to look at the top half, and I'm going to repeat that procedure. I'm going to do another cut. Everything in the bottom of that top half is going to be um, bin two. It's going to get a value of one, and so on and so forth. So now I went from a feature matrix where my features were not on the same scale to a feature matrix where my features are on the same scale. So now what I want to do is I want to get rid of features that are highly correlated. So what I will do is I will have a graph theoretic approach to it, which is I will make a feature graph where I'm going to connect one feature to another feature. And if they do not agree, uh, if, if they do not disagree by more than a certain amount, I'm going to collapse them. And I'm going to take the feature that I found first, because the features that I find first are um, less complex. And so, um, so even though there is a threshold, it's set automatically, and you can read about the details in the paper. I won't go through uh, any more of it. The thing that I want you to take away from this one box is basically you give me a sparse matrix, which is a representation of your network, and I'm going to start from the nodes, and I'm going to build these features up, and I'm not going to use any features about triangles. Triangles are hard to do. Triangles and databases is join. You will die on a join. You should not die on a join, right? So we're not going to try to find triangles. We're just going to look at in-degree, out-degree weights, and so on and so forth, and try to squeeze as much information as we can based on that information. So now I went from my n-dimensional space to my f-dimensional space. But this f-dimensional space is still a bit noisy. And so what I want to really do is smooth it out. And so that's where uh, we're going to do a role extraction where I'm actually going to define my roles and assign my nodes to my roles, right? And what's cool about this is that I go from this n-dimensional space to this f-dimensional space, which was much smaller, but now I'm going to this r-dimensional space, which is even smaller than f. So I go, let's say, from 100,000 um, 100, to 300 to 9, right? So in terms of the number of columns, right? So if I started with an adjacency matrix, which had 100,000, 100,000, now I have 100,300, after the recursive feature extraction, 
And then after I do the roll extraction, I have 100,000 by nine. And so by doing this, I've effectively done dimension and reduction and grouping and define my roles all in the same shot. So how do we do this? So one of the things was that we really want to do soft clustering, right? As I told you, we need a mixture of things. So what we decided to do was uh, to use non-negative matrix factorization. So we didn't invent non-negative matrix factorization, and it's been around for a very long time. I have uh, now this uh, node by feature matrix, which I'm going to call V. And what I'm going to do is I'm trying to factorize it into two other matrices, G and F where G is going to be my node by role matrix, and F is going to be my role by features matrix. The role by features matrix is where my roles are actually defined. And then my node by role matrix is which roles does Tina belong to, right? So perhaps um, this row is Tina, and which roles does Tina belong to? NMF is very popular, it's computationally uh, efficient, because you're doing multiplicative updates. You're not doing additive updates, like, like gradient descent that does additive updates. And the key thing about it is that the factors, that is the entries in this matrix and that matrix are non-negative, which people can make sense of. So this idea of part-based um, system, where a, a row here is a linear combination of uh, the row here and the column there. And if you don't know about non-negative matrix factorization, you can come to me and I'll tell you more about it uh, and during the break. So, but the one thing about here is, how many roles do I have? I don't know. You come and you give me data. This happens to me all the time. People say, hey, Tina, here's the data. Can you do something for this? I, they don't give me much background about it. I don't know how many roles is in your data. So what I want to do is do something like model selection. So the idea is that basically what I want to do is I want to find as few roles as possible to compress the data well. And so whenever I talk to you about compression, you should think about minimum description length. So basically, I want the number of rows that's going to minimize my description length. My description length is equal to how many bits do I need to store my model, and how many bits do I need to store my error. And um, so that's what we do. So we have an equation in terms of how to compute how complex your model is, and how to compute how complex your error is, or how many bits your error needs. And again, I won't go through the details. If you're interested about the nitty gritty of the details, um, I'm happy to talk to you. For example, why are we using KL divergence as opposed to the L2 norm, etc. Okay, so I went through this procedure, right? Great, two black boxes, everything's great. No, right, because now I have this. Now what I'm trying to show you here is this is the network science co-authorship network that Mark Newman put together. And uh, each node actually has a pie chart but because we're humans and we can't deal with information overload, I'm showing you the most prominent role that a node has as opposed to uh, you know, the pie chart because each node here actually belongs a little bit to uh, the blue circle, a little bit to the red diamond, and so on and so forth. So how do I make sense of this, right, where I can actually assign human understandable labels to it? So one thing um, that you may say is, wait a second, you said that I have this matrix roll by features. I'm just going to look at that. The problem is that those features, a lot of them are these recursively generated features that no human being should ever at one should spend time on. I mean, I have spent time on it, but it's not pretty. So the way that we're going to do it is as follows. I have my node by roll matrix. What I'm going to do is I'm going to compute another matrix, which is node by features I understand. I know what eccentricity means. If you have a high eccentricity in a graph, you're on the periphery of the graph. It's going to take you a lot longer to go from one place to the other. If you have a high gatekeeper and I were to remove you, the number of connected components in the graph increases. If you have a high page rank, you're somehow a more important node, right, in terms of centrality or other kinds of, uh, of importance to you. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to create another matrix, which is node by these features I understand, which is this M matrix. I have my node by role matrix. And now I have three matrices. Two of them I know. One of them I don't know. I'm going to do non-negative least squares regression, right? I have three matrices. Two of them are known. One of them is unknown. I just can compute it. Now by computing that, what I get is how much do you belong um, to like how important is your feature when you belong to this particular role? So this role contribution to node characteristics. 
where I can find that if your um, primary role is a gatekeeper, uh, you tend to be in role two. So if role two was your primary role, then your gatekeeperness is very high. Or if role three was your primary role, your eccentricity is very high. You're on the edges of the network. So that way I can assign actually human understandable uh, roles to you. I can do the same thing in terms of your neighbors. So I have the node by role matrix, which is this G matrix. And what I can do is I can compute this N matrix where the rows are the people and the columns are um, the roles I found, and for a particular entry, I say what percentage of Tina's friends had their primary role be role one, and so on and so forth. And, and then I'm going to do again a non negative least squares regression and find this Q. Again, three matrices, two of them known, one of them unknown. I can uh, figure it out. And then by doing that computation, I find out that if your primary role was role one, the majority of your neighbors also had their primary role be role one. And that way, I can assign a human understandable label of cliquey to role one. And so by now, I have actually made sense of these things. I'm happy I can move on. So what are some of the applications of these things? So one of the things that you should think about is that I went from this network to basically every node having a feature vector. And now that I have a feature vector for this node based on the topology of the network, what I can do is I can do uh, similarity. I can try to see if you're an outlier. So for example, we ran <coughs> this through the thing in Ron email data set. We were tracking a person's roles and where their, when their title changed, their role distribution changed, right? So I can do many, many different things. Uh, the two uh, applications that I'm gonna talk about is exploration in the role space and the role transfer. So um, this guy, uh, Russell Journey, he is an entrepreneur in the Bay Area, and about two and a half years ago, he came to me and he said that he's interested in mapping the space of big data companies. And so what he did was he went to uh, four big company sites, Hortonworks, uh, Pivotal, Cloudera, and MapR. He went to their partner uh, business uh, website. From there, he took all of those companies and then went to their partner website. So think about snowball sampling from those four companies. And he built this network, and then he ran it through uh, the role discovery procedure that I just talked to you guys about. It automatically found three roles for him. One is this green role. These are the big data vendors, uh, equal uh, opportunity bridges. Then there are these red ones, which are middle uh, men, um, general IT vendors, and the blue ones that are these small vendors that really want to become big and to have strong affinity with the big vendors. And if you peer in, you see that, for example, the big vendors are IBM, Cloudera, HP, Microsoft. The middleman is Red Hat here. And you have all these small um, blue ones. So then what he wanted to do was he wanted to do community discovery. So he ran the famed Lil Wayne al algorithm on this network, on his original network. And the communities he found did not make sense to him. So what he did was he removed the blue, uh, the nodes whose most prominent role was this blue, the small vendors, and ran the Lovain algorithm. And he was able to get communities that actually made sense to him. So when I said that community discovery and uh, role discovery are complementary, this is what I meant by it, right? Now, of course, there have been others that, for example, tried to optimize for role discovery and community discovery at the same time. He didn't do that here, right? He did the role discovery first. He chucked some of the nodes that whose roles um, uh, were um, not as useful in terms of community discovery, then ran it through community discovery. But there are other algorithms that try to do the uh, objective functions at the same time. So, and if you want to play with this, uh, he has some very nice demos where you can go and play with the space of big data companies in the US. Um, and again, I'm going to put my slides up, or Claudia is going to put my slides up, so you don't have to write it down. So the other thing that I really like, because I'm a machine learning person, I like the role transfer idea. So if you give me the social network of Luxembourg and you have some annotations on the nodes about who's good and who's bad, and I learn a classifier, I want to be able to take that classifier and apply it, let's say, to the French social network without having to go and beg you for some label data about who's good and who's bad. So how would I do this here? 
Well, you give me a network. I know this looks like a tree because I'm lazy and I didn't want to make a graph. Uh, and so then you have like nodes that have been labeled. Like somebody actually came and labeled it as this is a blue node, this is a red node, and this is a green node. And not all the nodes have to be labeled. You send this through the role discovery, you get your role membership. So these are my nodes, these are the roles, this is how much they belong to the different roles, and these are the, my role definitions. And uh, because I have, a, I have classes, and now this is the traditional machine learning feature table, I can feed it to any classifier, right? Naive base, support vector machine, whatever you like. Now you come and you give me another network, right? And so how can I map this network into the same role space? Well, it's relatively easy. I have my role definition, so I know these features. I can extract them from this network. So now I have the node by feature uh, matrix for this network based on these features. I have the role definitions. And what I can do is, again, I can do non-negative least squares regression to find the role memberships for these nodes. It's, again, the same procedure as Three matrices, two of them are known, one of them is unknown. I should be able to compute that. And now that these nodes are in the same role space as the one on top, I can apply the classifier and get labels for it. Right? Easy does it. So how does this work? What I'm trying to show you here is data that we had from uh, two conferences, conference A and conference B. These are IPIP IP communication network. What I want you to see is that in the bottom here, this particular data set, IP, IP um, data set, uh, the class distribution is very different than, for example, this one, right? It has a lot of peer-to-peer. -peer. For machine learning, we know that if I train on this IP data and test on this one, I should not be able to do well. But we see that with the roles, we are actually able to do well. So here, on the x-axis, I'm showing you what, what training set I use and what testing set I use. On the y-axis, I'm showing you the classification accuracy. The black bar is the default or how hard the task is, which is what's the most prominent class in my train set. Remember, in my test set or the target network, I have no labels. Because I have no labels, I cannot do inference on it, right? So, and then the red bar is the classifier I learn based on the roles. The blue bar is the classifier I learn based on the features. And the differences between the red and the blue is statistically significant at p-value of 0.01. So, and basically the red is higher than the blue. What does this make you think? What, it makes you think that by going from the feature space to the role space, I have been able to smooth out some noise. And that's why I'm able to um, do better in this latent uh, factor role space in terms of classification. Even when I train on a data set whose class distribution is very different than the test set. So what I talked about so far is just the first generation of the role discovery. So as I said, we had a really hard time publishing it, but, but since we published it in 2012, uh, you know, it kind of took off. And so both we continued some work on it, but a lot of other people jumped on the bandwagon, and they're still publishing on the, on the role stuff, including, for example, at this year's KDD or in December at the IEEE Data Mining Conference. And among these papers, you will see some papers which are about graph embedding. So one of the things that's extremely popular in computer science now is how can I embed this graph in this feature space? And for example, one of the uh, methods uh, that was very uh, successful, I think I should have it here, uh, I don't. So there's a deep walk paper uh, where the idea was that I'm gonna <laughs> create vectors for nodes based on different walks that I do from the local node itself. But I'm gonna to talk to you guys about the two that are, are highlighted in red. And if you're interested in any, any other kind of formalization or what objective function they used, I'm happy to talk to you about them. So the first thing is, I, I keep talking about this role space and you may say, okay, if I have some information, some guidance that I can give you, how can you take that into account? And so the idea is that the procedure is the same. I, I get your network, I represent it as an adjacency matrix, I extract the features, I do my non-negative matrix factorization with model selection, but now I take your guidance into account. Your guidance, for example, could be that when you're defining this role space, I want my roles to be defined such that if a feature contributes to a role with a very small amount, I want you to zero that out. Or I want features that, I want roles that are defined on very different features. I want my roles to be diverse. 
Or you may say, you know what, I already know that there's going to be bridges in my network. I don't care that you're going to find those whose most prominent role is a bridge. Find me other types of roles. And so we can do that. We can take that guidance into account and find the right role space. So how do we do this? The way that we do it is by adding um, convex uh, constraints to uh, the, uh, either the columns of G, and these are the role assignments to the nodes, or the rows of F, which is where the roles are defined. So, and, uh, and the actual um, optimization is just al uh, alternating least squares. And again, if you want to know more about the algorithm itself, um, come talk to me during the break. So if you come to me and you say that I'm interested in sparse, uh, um, sparsely defined role spaces, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put an L1 constraint on the, uh, on the column in G or the uh, row in F. The row in F, again, is how the, feature, how the role is defined, right? So the sparsity means that if a feature is contributing to this role with a very small amount, I will zero it out, right? Or if a, uh, this node um, belongs very, to a very small amount to this role, I will zero that out. The next thing is diversity, which is I want to define roles such that this role and this role are defined by very different features. I don't want roles that are very close to each other. And so again, I can do uh, the angular similarity of how I am uh, defining my, uh, my roles uh, based on the, uh, how my roles are defined in the features or how my roles are assigned to different nodes. And then um, the next thing which I said, which is this uh, idea of, oh, I already know these roles, find the other roles. I could do that again by looking at the angular similarity of the roles that I'm finding and the roles that you already said you had. And in fact, this is a very interesting area. So when you come to me and you say, I already know that I'm going to have these global bridges, and I take that into account, what happens is I find local bridges. And so it seems to me that there is this hierarchy, this taxonomy on the, the role spaces that we are finding, which would be interesting to inspect. And so for example, one of the things that you can use this for is for re-identification. So um, here I'm showing you a plot of um, some co-authorship networks. And so I have the KDB co-authorship network, but this is the main data mining conference of ACM. And on the x-axis, I am showing you different conferences that are related to KDB. The percentage overlap is the percentage overlap of authors from uh, this conference to that conference to that conference. So the highest in um, terms of recall I can get are the numbers here. And one of the things that we see is that if I actually define diverse roles, I'm able to do better on re-identification than if I don't use diversity in how I define my roles. And then the next thing is, you may say, I'm not interested in simple networks. I actually have these more complicated networks. So I have multi-relational networks. So here I'm showing you a co-sponsorship uh, graph uh, based on uh, congressional data. So the nodes are Congress people. And so Pelosi is related to Blunt because they co-sponsored the agriculture bill number one. They're also related because uh, they co-sponsored education bill one. Right, that kind of a thing. Now, one caveat, if you have studied co-sponsorship of bills in America, it's not exactly like co-authorship. So we are losing some information by representing it as co-authorship. Usually the way that it works is somebody comes up with a bill, then another person joins, then another person joins, so on and so forth. It's slightly different than co-authorship. Uh, and if you are interested in it, I can put you in touch with my colleague David Lazar, who can tell you all about it. So now, as opposed to having a, an adjacency matrix, I have this data cube where I have a person, person, and a committee. Where, for example, this is the education committee, and I have how many, the number of bills that this person and this person co sponsored in this particular committee. And so, what I want to do is, I want to be able to factorize this and find the roles for it. And so I can do the same kind of procedure. Um, so now what I'm going to do in terms of recursive feature extraction is I'm going to do feature extraction on every um, co-sponsorship graph. And then I'm going to uh, use the intersection of the features that I find. So now I went to my person feature committee. Now that I have my person feature committee, what I can do is factorize it. So as opposed to non-negative matrix factorization, we're going to use non-negative Tucker decomposition. 
Again, we're going to use all alternating least squares. We're not going to assume any orthogonality on the factors. What are the factors? I get three factor matrices. So I have my uh, group definitions. So this is how I'm going to group my nodes or my Congress people. I have my roles, which is again how in some sense I'm going to group my features to define my roles. I'm going to have these topics which is how I'm going to group my relations. These are my committees. And then I'm going to have my tensor core, which is going to tell me how these groupings are related to each other. So let's see how this all works out. So I told you about the congressional data. We looked at uh, a whole bunch of committees. We looked at uh, Congress from Carter to the end of uh, the second Bush, the Bush uh, junior. Um, and uh, so, for example, just as, a, uh, as uh, how many bills are co-sponsored in one Congress, this is uh, the 110th Congress is uh, Bush Jr.'s second term, and over 10,000 bills were co-sponsored there. So I have this procedure, right? I have my, my nodes, which are my Congress people. I have my features, which are what the uh, refx plus extracted. And I have my relations, which are the different committees. And I send it to this um, uh, multi-relational uh, role discovery. And I get my three factor matrices and my core tensor core. And I can look at this group definitions. And I can see, oh, here's all of the members that belong to group uh, one and how much they belong to it. Then what I can do is I can go to this um, tensor core and I can extract that slice for group one and look at the roles versus the relational topics that I extracted. And I see that, wait a second, people who belong to this role one a lot participated a lot in role five and this relational topic three. I can look into that and I can see that the relational topic three um, they operate a lot in oversight and government reform, and uh, they tend to be very active in Rule 5. And so these are Democrats that are mostly not mid-career, and they're active in this oversight uh, committee. And they tend to be on the periphery of the network, but they have a lot of triangles. That's something we do not expect if you're on the periphery of the network to have a lot of triangles. Now, one of the things that is interesting is that all of this analysis is just by looking at degree. Right? I am not doing text analysis. I did text analysis for my PhD. I will never do text analysis again. I mean, I'm done with it. Right? This is just degree of what, who's connected to whom. Uh, no. There's not enough money in the world. So, <laughs> now, the same day that I did a role transfer with the simple matrix, I can do role transfer here. And so how would I do role transfer here? You give me data for one Congress, I factorize it, then I use my factorization to recompute um, the, the tensor, right? So if you give me this, I can multiply them together and get a cube, a data cube. Now I can see the difference between that data cube and the data cube I get for a different Congress. So we did this. On the x-axis, oh, I'm sorry, this is all bleeding together. On the x-axis, you're, you're seeing the roles that was extracted for one Congress. And on the y-axis, you're seeing how well it fit the other Congress. And I'm showing you the heat map of fit quality. Obviously, in this, uh, this diagonal, you would expect it to be one. So if I extract roles from one Congress and I reconstruct it for that same Congress, I shouldn't have as much error, right? Um, zero error, hopefully. So one of the things which is interesting here is that there seemed to be a shift in 103rd Congress. 103rd Congress is when uh, Bill Clinton was impeached. But in particular, we think that we discovered the hastert rule. So there was a speaker, Dennis Hastert, during that time. He's now in jail. Um, where uh, he, there was a bill, a hastert rule, which, where, which was um, you, uh, a bill cannot come to the floor if the majority of the majority party does not agree, right? So right now I have Republicans who are the majority. If the majority of the Republicans don't want this bill to be discussed on the, on the Congress floor, then it wouldn't be discussed on the Congress floor. So we think that we discovered this, and currently I'm working with a political science graduate student at Harvard to see if we can find other kinds of, of uh, roles and, and uh, rules, uh, rule changes. Um, so why are roles effective? Uh, we're trying to encode these complex uh, behaviors 
And we are putting a lot of faith in the fact that you have some relationship with somebody else, right? So I'm doing relational dependency. If you give me a graph that is a random graph, I cannot do anything, right? I live and die by relational dependency. If there is no relational dependency, there's nothing for me to do, right? Um, and so we're able to capture those relational dependencies by mapping the network that you're giving me into this lower dimensional space. And in particular, it's useful because these lower dimensional spaces seem to generalize across different networks. And so if you're interested in this, there are lots of papers on it, uh, tutorials. And um, the, so the code for this has been, uh, is part of Yuri Neskovich's SNAP, Stanford Network Analysis Project. So if you want to play with it, you can go to, to uh, SNAP and download it. Uh, it's also part of IBM System G, and governments in the US are also using it and in Belgium. And this work, as I said, it started uh, a, a while ago, and I have a lot of good collaborators um, throughout uh, for this work. And one of the things that we are doing, so before I move on to my next topic, one of the things that we're doing with this is, I want, let's say I have teams, right? So I have different uh, um, football, soccer teams. And what I want to do is I want to extract the roles of the players. And if a player dies or resigns, I want to know who do I replace for him that will not change the dynamics of the network. That is, it will have this, this guy will have the same interaction with everybody else, and it will have the same attributes. So this idea of um, how do I make better substitutions for somebody if somebody were to resign uh, from one team? Any questions on this? I know I went through it rather, rather fast. OK, we can come back to it. OK, so next I'm going to talk about um, tie strength. Um, so the problem is as follows. Um, I'm given a bipartite graph of people on one side and events on the other. And I need to extract the uh, weighted social network of the people. So I'm with you in this. Uh, in this gathering, I go with you to Cancun, and then I go with you to Amsterdam, and so on and so forth. And the fact that I'm with you at all these different events should signal that we have some kind of relationship, right? And what I want to know is, I want to know how strong that relationship is. And so the big uh, assumption, and in fact this is where you should always hold feet of computer scientists, especially people who do data mining and machine learning or data science, to the fire, which is what are the assumptions you're making. And if you're doing some Bayesian statistics, your assumptions tend to be obvious. If you're not doing Bayesian statistics, then your assumption is not obvious. And so you should hold um, their feet to the fire even more. But the assumption is that because I'm on all these different events with you, we have some kind of a tie together. And so what's the motivation of this? So this problem actually came to me from one of the sponsors that I had for my research. And the idea was that uh, most real world networks are actually bipartite. They are not unipartite, right? So if you ever work on a co-authorship network, co-purchasing network, any of the co-networks, it's actually uh, a, a, a bipartite network that you project it to a unipartite network. And so it can, um, and also if you're working on, let's say, the Facebook uh, social network, um, Tina has lots and lots of friends, and clearly she is not related to all of them with the same amount. Right, so I want to somehow rank Tina's friends so that if um, Tina's best friend when it comes to news from Greece reads something about Greece, then that is shown to Tina as opposed to some other friend of Tina that read something about Greece. So the challenge is to do like which of these links in this unipartite graph are important. And so we want to infer this implicit way to social network. Um, now I mentioned tie strength, so tie strength you should think of it as a function that either it's going to rank all of my edges in a graph, or it's going to rank uh, the edges of a particular person, depending on what point of view is interesting to you. And so it's a simple tie strength measures common neighbor, right? How many papers did I read, uh, write with you? Uh, how many classes were we in together? Uh, how many um, uh, part parties did we go? So here's a picture of a, uh, of a weighted social network that my student, Mangesh Gupta, came up with. He liked Shakespearean plays. So he started with all the characters in Macbeth, all the scenes in Macbeth. He linked the character to a scene if that character appeared in that scene. Then he went and he picked this tie strength measure and uh, fed that bipartite graph through this and got this. So what is this tie strength measure doing? It's saying I'm going to sum over all the common parties or all the, all the common scenes that you and B were in 
And for each common scene, I'm going to give them one over the number of people in that scene, right? So here's scene one. Macbeth and Lady Macbeth were in it. He's going to say how many people were in that scene. That's capital P, right? He's going to take the cardinality of that set as one over capital P. Here's another scene. Lady Macbeth was in it, but Macbeth wasn't in it, so I'm not going to do anything. Here's another scene. They were both in it. I'm going to do one over again, number of people who are in that scene. And this seems reasonable, right? So Lady Macbeth and Macbeth have a very thick um, um, edge, so they have very high tie strength. And then the rest, if you know Macbeth, it should make sense to you. Um, but the question is, there's lots and lots of them out there, and how do you pick from them, right? And in fact, as I'm speaking to you now, like three people are writing papers about, here's another tie strength measure, right? So how would you choose? Would you like put your hand in a bucket, grab a bunch as much as you can, and grab a whole bunch of data sets and run and then see what happens? Um, that's not very satisfying. So what we tried to do is, this is when in Rome, so this, I, work, I did this work when I was at Rutgers, and there's a lot of computational complexity people, a lot of theoreticians there. And so uh, we decided to, uh, to do an axiomatic approach to this problem. So the idea is that I'm going to sit down, I'm going to think about some properties that a tie strength measure should satisfy, and then I'm going to see if I can prove a characterization theorem, saying that if you satisfy these properties, then I can write you in the same form, and then I can compare you mathematically. Right, as opposed to empirically. So let's look into this. So again, this is our running example. I have some people and I have some events. And what I really want to do is extract this, this network up top. But actually, one of the results that we found is that there are no fixed set of axioms that will give you a total ordering on the edges where you can come up with a graph on the top there. What you get is a partial ordering. And by a partial ordering, what I mean is that I cannot, just by set of axioms, decide whether A, B has a higher tie strength than C, D. And I will describe why that is and so on and so forth. Okay, so we sat down and we came up with eight, eight axioms. Now you may say, why eight? Why not nine? Why not seven? And so we needed this, these eight to be able to prove the characterization theorem. If you can't prove a characterization theorem with an axiomatic approach, then you are not getting the carrot at the end of the stick. And I like to get the carrot at the end of the stick. So. Um, let's go through these quickly. Number one, um, I like looking at the structure itself. Again, I'm lazy. I don't really like content. And content comes with all this problem about privacy and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm a computer scientist. I, I don't like to deal with that. You're a hashed ID and that's it. Um, so I'm just going to look at the structure, right? I'm not going to look at the content. So I'm going to say that BC, BD, DE, and CD in this network they all have the same uh, amount of time strength because they all attended one party where three people were there. I, I don't know if uh, you know, B and C are married, for example. That's what I mean by content, right? Adding content and coming up with axioms for it and then proving the characterization theorem is extremely difficult. And so that's baby steps. So the other uh, uh, axiom that we have, or property, is baseline. So time strength is a numeric value, and I want to normalize it. So I want to know what zero means here. And so if there are absolutely no events, um, then the tie strength between two people is zero. And then the next thing is that if I have two people and one single event that they attended, then at most their tie strength is one. Again, I want to be able to have bounds on, on the tie strength. So I want to know what, what zero means and what one means, and that's, uh, that's our baseline axiom. Um, the next one is frequency and intimacy, and in fact, this is why there's a, a, cottage, industri a cottage industry of tie strength measures. Frequency says more events will create stronger ties. So the more I see you, the stronger my uh, affection is to you. Now, uh, if you talk to a sociologist, they say it's not just frequency, it's that I see you and I have a good time, right? Which makes sense, right? So if I see you and I have a, not a good time, my tie strength with you is going to go down. But we're assuming that if I see you and I don't have a good time, then I try not to see you again, right? And so the frequency is going to go down anyway. The next one is intimacy, which is that the smaller events I attend with you, the stronger my tie gets to you, right? So if you and I go to dinner and it's just you and me, I can pay more attention to you. Versus in this big room, my attention is going, uh, is going every, uh, every way, right? Every which way. So those are these two, and I'll talk a little bit more about them. The next one is popularity, which is 
the larger the event, the more ties are created. So not necessarily stronger, but more, because there's more opportunity in terms of making ties with people. And then uh, the next two are people who really like network effects start pulling their hair out, which is, the first one is that my tie string to other people only depends on the actions I do, and not on the actions I do not do. So I'm only looking at, oh, Tina went to this party, not that Tina didn't go to this party. I don't know why Tina didn't go to that party. Well, I guess I should know, but you know, sometimes. Uh, so, right? So perhaps you don't like the person, or you're sick, or so on and so forth. I don't know. I'm not going to take that into account. Um, axiom seven is just the dyadic form of it, which is that the tie string between two people only depends on the events I see them at, not at the events that they do not attend. And so this may, should make you think that, oh, there are these measures of tie string, which is, says it's okay that Tina and Bob did not go to the same party. Tina has a lot of friends that went to a lot of parties with Bob's friend, right? And so they should have some tie string. But we're saying no. I didn't see Tina and Bob at the same party ever. And so that itself is a signal I should take into account. And then, um, so this should make you think that basically what we're looking at is a monotonically increasing function g, which based on every time you and I are in a particular event together will give us some measure of tie string. And then the last one is submodularity, which is a bit of a misnomer, but the name stay, which just basically is saying that um, the marginal increase that I get by being in an event with you is at most the tie strength I was going to get by just being in that one single event with you. So if I have the tie strength between two nodes, U and V, and I have what happened to them before, and I have this particular event here in Sardinia, if I were to take everything in the past away, that difference is less than or equal to the tie strength they were going to get for this particular event in Sardinia itself. So we have these eight, and these eight axioms, you give me a bipartite graph, I can come up with a partial order for you, and I can explain to you why this partial order, based on the axioms, which actually people have found very useful, right? Which I'm coming with a partial ordering of the people in your bipartite network, and I can explain why that ordering. So we think that our, our axioms are fairly intuitive, but several of the previous measures will break them, uh, as I already foreshadowed it for you. And one of the negative results we had was that um, the axioms cannot come up with a partial order. And the reason the axioms cannot come up with a total order, not a partial order, the total order, is this tension between frequency and intimacy. So let me give you an example. Scenario one, Mary and Susan go to two party, and they're the only two people there. Scenario two, Mary, Susan, and Jane go to three parties, and they're the only three people there. In which scenario is Mary's tie to Susan stronger? And you may say, I don't care about this. But if you don't care about this, then you don't care about all the tie strength measures that are out there. Right? This is why the difference. This is why doing an axiomatic approach helps. Because you see where the differences are between the different tie strength measures. So do you care more about intimacy, or do you care more about frequency? So as I said, the axioms will produce this natural partial order, and this is only pertaining to ordinal ranking applications. And then if you pick a particular tie strength measure that satisfies the axioms, it's similar to picking a linear extension of the partial order. And there's a proof of this in the paper, and this decision is not obvious. So the decision of, I care about intimacy more than frequency, is not obvious. right? And this is where, again, you would need to talk with some subject matter experts. And the details are in this other paper. So now, this is the carrot on uh, at the end of the stick, which is, can I prove a characterization theorem for the axioms that I came up with? And the idea is, well, I'm just going to state the theorem, so don't worry about it. You give me a graph, which is bipartite, or two mode, if you're a social scientist. I have my people, and I have my, uh, my events. And I have the, uh, the links show that this person attended that party. If you give me a tie string function that satisfies the eight axioms that I talked about, then I can rewrite your, uh, your tie string measure in the following form. There is a, uh, I thought I had um, underscored. So there are two functions, G and H. G is this monotonically increasing submodular function, which takes every common event that we were at and somehow aggregates the values it's giving us for every common event. And H is this monotonically decreasing function, 
which is bounded by one at one end and one over um, n choose two, which is the, uh, the number of choices, the number of tie pairs that you can create on the other end. And what you're going to basically do is for every common event that the two people were at, you're going to send it to this h function and then you're going to send it to this g function. And now I can tell you what that h and g function are for very commonly used tie string measures. And so these are some of the commonly used tie string measures. Those are the, the formulas for them. And uh, you can divide tie string measures into the ones that are self referential and the ones that are not self referential. So the self-referential uh, ones are, for example, the cat's measure, which is my tie strength with you. It depends on the number of paths between you and me, but it's exponentially decaying. Or like sim rank, which says that my tie strength with you is recursively computed based on the tie strength of our neighbors. And then there are these common ones like common neighbor or jacquard, jacquard. So common neighbor is just intersection, right? Jacquard is intersection over the union, which is you're normalizing on how social you are. And then the famous like Adam and Godard, delta and linear, which is my tie string with you increases as the number of events increase. But as, as we will see for every common event, I, it's just one over a simple number of people that attended it. So these are the tie string measures that are popularly used that satisfy our, our axioms. And as I promised, I can break them down into this G and H function. So the majority of them are sum. So they sum over all the common events that we attended. And then per event, they're either a constant, like common neighbor, that doesn't care about how many people were that in that common event, or they are um, these series, like delta, atomic, Kadar, and linear, which is one over a simple function of uh, the number of people that attended it. So with linear, is one over just the number of people that attended it. With atomic, Kadar, is one over log of n, the log of the number of people that attended it. With delta, is one over n choose two. Now, we threw this max in. Basically, what it says is that my tie strength with you doesn't increase as the number of events increases. Uh, it's just the maximum of the set of the common events that we attended and the tie strength I got for you. Now, one of the things that this shows is why sum? Why not log sum? Why not another function? Why can't I learn what the aggregation function should be? Right? I should be able to do that if I'm a machine learning person. And then um, the other one is all these common measures that people use that do not satisfy uh, the axioms. And the reason they don't is Usually it's because they want to take the indirect network effects into account. That T and Bob didn't attend a common event, but they have a lot of friends that did, so that means that they are somehow related. And so because of that, I can't break them down into this G and H. So let's look at some results for this. Uh, so we have a whole bunch of um, networks from uh, Shakespeare. We have this Southern Woman data set, which is a beloved data set of some sociologists in America. It's 18 women who went to 14 parties. And then we have the MIT reality mining data. These are Bluetooth connections. So uh, they're different devices, and they've connected. And the event is that these two Bluetooth devices or these three Bluetooth devices connected. And then there's the Enron emails, which is I have uh, the email is the event, and the to, from, etc. CC is uh, the people. So the accounts are the people, the emails are the events. Um, the obligatory degree distribution, obviously with Shakespeare and play, you wouldn't expect the heavy tail. You just couldn't put that many people on, on the stage. Um, OK, so the first thing that you want to do is figure out how complete your axioms are or your properties are. Basically, I want to know the number of tie strings that my partial order cannot resolve. So obviously, I want this number to be small. Right? I don't want to have a partial order where the number of ties that I cannot resolve is very high. Now you may say, wait a second, the graphs you showed me, the number of nodes were rather small. Why are the tie pairs so large? The reason the tie pairs are large is because there's a tie, so there's two. There's a pair, which is a two. So it's n choose two, then two from that. So this is the thing here. Right. So what I want is I want this number to be small, and we see that the numbers are relatively small, the percentages are relatively small. So uh, the axioms, you give me a bipartite graph, I run it through an axiom, it comes up with a partial order, the amount of partial order that there is is small, which makes me happy, right? Uh, I don't have that much uncertainty there. So that's the first takeaway point, which is uh, the uh, number of tie pairs in which the different tie uh, strength functions differ is small. 
Um, the next one is, what is uh, the, uh, can I quantify the conflict between the axioms and the functions that don't satisfy the axioms, right? If I take this uh, network effects into account, and if I take the network effects into account, the, the computation is more. Uh, I don't like the computation. Um, how, how, much, uh, how much conflict there is. And so we looked at jacquard and temporal. So temporal says that uh, I spend time proportional to my tie strength with you at your event. And again, what we see is that these numbers are relatively small, which is nice, which is that the people who are taking the network effects and are spending more time computationally, um, that our difference in terms of ranking and theirs is small, which is good. Um, now you may say, oh, this is small because these networks are sparse, so you're getting a lot of tie strengths that are zero, and this is partially true. However, there are tie strength measures that conflict with our axioms that don't actually give zero uh, when, uh, when you uh, actually haven't attended a common event together. But we showed this uh, empirically as well on our data sets. So basically, these are the number of tie pairs between these data sets. These are the tie pairs excluding the zeros. The, the, the numerators will stay the same in terms of their conflict. And then if I were to plot them here on the x-axis, you're seeing the different data sets. On the y-axis, you're seeing the percentage conflict. The top here is 14%. The top here is 7%. And uh, so this is for jacquard. This is for temporal, um, the temporal proportional. And again, it jumps a little bit. The percentage of conflict jumps a little bit, but not by much, right? Here, I went from a little under 8% to a little over 9%. So then the take home point number two here would be that the percentage of conflict between the axioms I just talked about and a function that does this recursive thing and looks at the network effects is not that different when you're interested in ordinal ranking. So if I put the two of these together, what you get is that if your application is ordinal ranking, just use common neighbor, right? And that's actually what a lot of people do. So you're actually doing the right thing even if you didn't know that you were doing it. So there is obviously a scalability issue. So even with Enron that has 32,000 nodes, if you were to do N choose two and two from that, you're getting 138 quadrillion. And even if you were to remove the tie strength that are zero, there's still a lot of tie pairs to look at. And then this work led to uh, some data from Washington Post. This is Washington Post, the newspaper, the fake news. Um, and so the data that they gave us was their social reader data. So about 37 million Facebook accounts, half a billion links, 106 million articles read over nine months. And uh, what they were interested in was how can we capture similarity? So basically, again, this is about rank Tina's friends uh, in terms of different topics. So that if Tina's friend, that is her best friend on Greece, reads an article, you want to show it to her. But if, let's say, Daniela reads an article about Greece, Tina doesn't really care because Daniela is not an expert in Greece. Hopefully. I don't know. I just saw you. I'm sorry. So, and then the other thing is that how fickle is Tina, right? So, like, for example, does Tina's best friends in terms of Greece change all the time, right? Uh, and, it, and it may be. Uh, so you want to be able to capture that, and then again, how do you effectively summarize uh, the, 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 these changes? So uh, we had a paper in uh, News KTD about this. If you're interested, I can talk to you more about that. And then just in terms of related work, obviously I cannot mention tie strength without mentioning uh, the work of Mark uh, Granovater in terms of weak ties. Uh, and then um, there are a lot of approaches that are using external information to figure out tie strings. So if you're using uh, Gmail, there's this uh, feature called Don't Forget About Bob, where if I put David Johnson and before that, let's say I have Mary Jackson, it would say, no, 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 you normally don't send an email to David Johnson when you send an email to Mary Jackson, right? So to, to, to tease it apart for you. Um, there are very few axiomatic approaches for, the, uh, for, for graph measures. So there's uh, the one about page rank um, that came out in 2005. And the reason being is it's very difficult to prove a characterization theorem. And then the other thing is that computer scientists really like brand new shiny algorithms, right? They don't like somebody that comes and tries to make sense of things, right? So just imagine if I come and I will able to reduce like 100 papers to basically what they're doing is expectation maximization, right? That paper will never get published. 
because those hundred authors will make sure that paper doesn't get published, even though it's really what they're doing is expectation maximization. Uh, so, and then obviously when I say tie strength, you should think about link prediction. There were some excellent survey papers initially about link prediction. There's this excellent paper on link prediction where they tried to do uh, an axiomatic approach, but they could not prove it in Ethereum. So they have a very nice theoretical justification of the various link prediction problems, <laughs> where they're mapping the graph into a latent space, and they're trying to make sense of why, for example, common neighbor or Adam Kadar is a good uh, link prediction method. Um, so these are the papers that are related to this part of the talk. One of the things that I didn't talk about uh, because I didn't want to talk about the graphical model was we used uh, the material we've learned from that work to do a social recommendation system. This work was with Allison Chaney and David Fly, uh, where basically to do a recommendation, I'm going to look at user preferences, Tina's preferences, item attributes, and user influence. So Tina's user influence on, for example, oh, this is a sci-fi book, but, and Tina doesn't like sci-fi, but Tina very much likes Daniela, and Daniela liked this book. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna recommend it to Tina. And if you use a Bayesian approach, then you can actually explain why you recommended something, a book to somebody, or, or an a, a object to somebody. And I know that these Bayesian networks are not in favor as much as all the deep learning that you hear. I'm happy to talk to you guys about deep learning, but the one thing with deep learning is you cannot make sense of things, right? Versus with these Bayesian models, with the graphical models, I can actually explain to you what is going on. So on that note, uh, thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer any questions. We have 15 minutes. I do have a postdoc position in my lab. So if you're looking for a postdoc position and you have a background in machine learning and data mining, I would be very happy to talk to you. So thank you very much. So one thing I was wondering during the first part of your talk was when you talked about role discovery. I mean, what is actually the way to evaluate that? I mean, how, how would you evaluate that? I mean, you're kind of looking at it and, you know, you said, okay, that makes sense. But, I mean, I guess you probably did more evaluation. So I was wondering what, what's a good approach of evaluating these kind of things. So the one way that we evaluate it is by role transfer, right? So I showed uh, the, uh, a slide about how we are able to transfer uh, from one IP network to another IP network through this role space. So a lot of our, our, our evaluations are whether I can do some kind of prediction, right? I know the actual result, whether I can do some kind of prediction. So I have this IP network, I map it into a role space. I learn a classifier. I have this other IP network. I map it into the same role space. Now, can I use the same classifier to predict? Obviously, I have a held out set, um, data set, and I see how well I can do. So a lot of it has been this kind of prediction in terms of transfer learning or within network classification. So I have one network, and for some people, I know they're fraud, and some people aren't. And I map it into the role space, and I see that with role space, I can do better in terms of predicting whether somebody's fraud and whether somebody isn't. But you're not comparing with any labeled ground truth data? Well, the labeled ground truth would be in terms of prediction, right? Do I predict that you are a good person to, uh, for me to give you a loan or not? So let me, so for example, recently I worked with the Belgian government in terms of companies that intentionally go bankrupt, right? I have some labeled data from them. I can take their data. It's a bipartite graph of company and people. It's actually a very interesting a problem. I was going to talk about that, but oh well. Um, so uh, I have these companies, and I know which one is bad or good, and I want to predict for the other ones. I have a held up uh, test set, just like in machine learning. I put it aside. I learn a classifier, and then I use the classifier to predict on that. The classifier is based on the roles. You see what I mean? Okay. So that's how we evaluate it. I do have ground truth. The ground truth is the held up set. Right? About who's good and who's bad. And now I've learned a model, let's say support vector machine, anything you like. And then I um, predict and I see how well I do. Yeah. But that means you always need to, I mean, know something about the role, right? Because for the example which you had with the big data companies, I mean, 
how would that be evaluated? There is no action related to the role, right? The, no, that's, that's totally descriptive. So I'm kind of wondering whether yeah. for these descriptive uh, images, I mean, it's very hard to kind of say whether the discovery is correct or not. And if you would use a different method, it would be slightly different, and you could always kind of label the colors and make sense out of it. Yeah, yes, so, so, that, so that's the, the exploration part, right? So whenever you're doing exploration and you don't have any ground truth, then in terms of evaluation, you can't do anything, right? So whenever it comes to evaluation with machine learning people, it's like, oh, can I come up with a confusion matrix? What's my true positive rate, my false positive rate, et cetera, et cetera. And that's how we have been evaluating the roles that we find in terms of how predictive they are, right? How well can I transfer knowledge from one network to another network? Right, like the IP, IP communication network, kind of stuff. Or networks over time. I think one of the axioms, if I remember correctly, the seven, uh, stated that you, um, the, the existence of other events to which the two people do not attend doesn't really impact the size strength, but. Yeah. Um, are there some cases in which the fact that two people avoid each other may play a role? Like, well, the problem with that is that uh, I don't know why they avoided each other, right? So it's actually an interesting problem you mentioned. So there's this work that's going to come out uh, by Sam Freiberger, who's a postdoc in our Network Science Institute, and Arun Sandarajan, where they have done um, this study where if there are a lot of wedges between you and me, so if you and I share a lot of common friends, but we are not friends, it's an indicator that our personalities are different. So they did this personality test thing. Uh, now, of course, there's a lot of problem with personality tests. I'm not going to go there, but that's what they showed. The thing with our work is that the fact that you and I have never been in an event is a very strong, uh, it, it is, uh, is a signal I cannot dissect. I don't know why we weren't in the same event, right? And I don't want to hazard a guess for it, right? Maybe we hate each other, like what Ar Arun and Sam have shown, or maybe, you know, we just, it just didn't work out. Our schedules didn't work out. So uh, at least when it comes to ranking, uh, order of ranking, um, it seems to not have that bit of, big of an effect, as I showed. And also, it's computationally a lot cheaper. So if you're going to have a startup and you want to do tie strength, just use common neighbor. If, if your application is order ranking, uh, it's just all, and, and that's what people do use, actually. So. Somebody else? Um. For the first part uh, about finding the role, what is the input data that you use only uh, the connection between the uh, node or do you have other data to describe the network? Uh, just connection between the nodes. If you have other data, I can take it into account. Like for example, how many friends does Tina have that are male and how many friends Tina have that are, uh, that are not male. Uh, but uh, basically all I need is the graph. I can use a directed graph, I can use a weighted graph. Uh, I can use an annotated graph, but all I need is a graph. So it is the the two uh, the, the two dimension metric, right? So right. Uh, un, un, uh, unless, for example, you have data that is multi-relational and you don't want to do the feature extraction from it, then you would use the data cube, right? The the idea that I'm going to do Tucker decomposition as opposed to non-negative matrix uh, factorization, right? Where I start with uh, person person and the different relationships that they have. So like multi-layer network kind of, that, that, that means that you'll be increasing. You can think you of it as multi-layer. I, I would be very, so, so multi-layer is a term that's thrown out a lot in terms of network science, and it's not really clear what multi-layer means. I mean, so multi-layer could be evolving over time. It could be that, oh, here's T now today, this is one layer, here's T now tomorrow, here's another layer. Or it could be some other kind of thing where there's a hierarchical relationship. But if you want to think of it as multi-layer, if, if multi-layer to you means multi-relation, then yes. But multi-layer is not clearly defined. Um, sorry. And for the second part, like I saw you have uh, many axioms, maybe I not catch up with uh, much, but actually the, your work is kind of like to project every axiom into one measure, right? For your work in the second part. 
Right, so the axioms were like, what are some of the properties that I want a tie string measure to satisfy? So this is something computer scientists don't do at all, right? I'm like, well, here's an objective function, and how can I optimize it as fast as possible? Here I am, uh, you know, being, uh, I'm thinking, okay, I want to measure tie string. What are the things that are important? These are the properties that are important. Frequency is important. Intimacy is important. Popularity is important, right? Am I going to take into account information on the node, the fact that Tina and Brandon are married, right? No, I'm not going to take that into account. If I don't take that into account, what does that mean? I want to be able to have bounds. What is zero? What does one mean, right? Because otherwise, it's very difficult to make sense of things, right? Just, just imagine doing, like, computing distance, right? We know what zero means, but, like, what's the relation between 20 and then 200 and 2,000? I don't know, right? To be able to normalize it is a good thing, right? So that's where the axioms came from. Because like in machine learning, we rather have like many axioms into features, and then we have a to learn, and then we can extract later which one is important or not to classify it. Um, yes, yes, you could do that. But the thing about that is that so then so so that goes to feature engineering, which is extremely important. Um, uh, but uh, the way to think about it was if you have different methods to do prediction for you, which one would you use? This is looking at it the other way. Right, as opposed to, oh, let me come up with really nice features and then I can feed it to anything I want, right? Uh, any kind of uh, whatever, you know, uh, method I want. Support vector machines, name base, uh, random parts. And uh, my last question is... Is that what I'm here for? Yeah. Because, because like, for your two words, it's kind of like trying to complex the uh, complex network into uh, a few feature. How can we interpret, interpret that feature into a kind of like maybe generalized to sociology? Like how can we interpret that? You mean the first part or the second part? Uh, both first and second part. Maybe first. Right. So the second part, um, actually, when I first talked about uh, the the tie string, uh, Michael Macy uh, cornered me and said, "You need to show that your axioms have something to do with trust." And for me to show that my axioms have something to do with trust, I need the following form of data. I need a bipartite network, and I need a, a social, a unipartite social network where the edges actually have a number on them that says the tie string. Getting that kind of data is extremely difficult, right? Because also people don't come and say that like Tina's tie string with Bob is 0 0.95, or you know, and with uh, whatever with John is 0 0.5 or something like that, or some kind of a ranking. It's very difficult for people to say that. Well, my best friend is Bob, and then it's John, and then it's Jack, and so on and so forth, right? So that's the one, that one. And then the other one in terms of the roles, we're already making sense of it through, uh, you know, coming up with features that we know what they mean, and then trying to assign, uh, assign some um, meaningful terms to them. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. still time for maybe the last question. So I guess I would like to just have one comment. So um, uh, I know that a lot of you guys are working on real data, and you're not so much in terms of, oh, I'm going to develop a new brand new algorithm, right? So for me, my bread and butter is I develop a new brand new algorithm. Or like Bruno, his, his bread and butter, he's coming up next, is here's a brand new algorithm, and my shiny new algorithm will beat Bruno's shiny new algorithm, right? But a lot of you don't do this, and so it's really applied machine learning. And in applied machine learning, there's no unified theory, right? You try different things like what you were saying, and then you say, okay, well, will this piece of information add more to what I'm trying to do? So, for example, I'm helping uh, my colleague Barabashi on a problem in terms of predict the peak sale of a book before, you know, I, I, here's a new book that's going to come out. Pre uh, pre predict its peak sale within the first three weeks, right? And so that process has been, okay, what are some of the features that are very important for this? And, for example, co-purchasing of books is important. Right? Fame of the author is important. The type of book it is is important. Right? That kind of a thing, it, you know, there is no glory in that. Right? But that's what you need to do to then solve whatever kind of data science problem you have. Right? Because usually, as you said, if you come up with nice features, then, uh, then your prediction task is extremely easy. And if you think that deep learning is going to solve your problem for you, it is not. Because all that it's doing is it's pushing the buck to the representation aspect. What's the right representation, right? What's the right network architecture that I need to use, right? And they keep increasing their models, making the networks bigger, 
to be able to, to capture the complexities of data. And they are overfitting. So I can point you to papers that shows that they're not generalizing, they're memorizing. Which as a machine learning person, it's like, what? I don't like memorizing. Okay? On that note, thank you for your attention. <laughs>